You're listening to The Come Up. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us on The Come Up, a podcast created to showcase the talents and lives of the best young players on the rise. Today, we have the special honor of having a minor league pitcher in the New York Mets organization on his way to the top, Garrison Bryant. Garrison, welcome to The Come Up. Thanks for having me, you guys. I appreciate it. So, Garrison, tell us a little bit more about yourself. Right now, you're on the active roster for the Binghamton Rumble Ponies, the AA team. Tell us a little bit more about yourself and how you got there. Um, well, I'm uh, originally from New Hampshire. Uh, I moved to Clearwater, Florida when I was in high school um, to pursue, you know, the idea of playing college football. Um, you know, that was the whole driving factor behind a lot of the decisions, you know, I made when I was younger, my family made when I was younger and uh, ended up, you know, playing baseball as well, like I'd always done. And then was fortunate enough to be pitching in a game that the Mets were there to watch. And, you know, I pitched pretty well and the rest is kind of history. You know, I, it was a quick transition from going football 100% to, Oh, I'm going to be a baseball player, you know, professionally. And, um, all happened really quick and now just, you know, doing the minor league grind and hopefully having the opportunity to, you know, play in the, play in the big leagues and take advantage of that opportunity. When you were younger, what exactly, or, or what, what was the decision process like going from football and transitioning over to baseball? Like, did you start out all baseball or did you start out all football and then transition or was it a combination of the two? Um, I mean, in Florida, it's a little different. I mean, Florida, it's baseball is year round football is year round. And like, if you're kind of a guy that plays both sports, you kind of have to make a decision eventually. And I was not at any point ready to make a decision until the Mets came calling. And I was like, Oh, that's an easy decision to make there. Like that's a, that somebody made the decision for me at that point. So, um, no, I was originally committed to go play football in New Mexico, um, to play college football out there. And I ended up getting drafted four days after I was supposed to report to co- in, enroll in college campus. So, um, I took a chance and was like, you know what, I'm going to hold out and see what happens with the draft. And, you know, I was, I had a good relationship with the Met scout and he pretty much assured me without, you know, guaranteeing me that I would be drafted. So that's kind of why, um, you know, the whole process for me is a lot different than a lot of guys. Cause a lot of guys spend, you know, their entire high school careers going to showcases, um, playing for, you know, organizations in different ways in summer ball. And you know, I didn't do any of that. I was, uh, I barely played a high school season. You know, I, if football practice ran late, I was late to baseball. I mean, that's how it was. All right, so kind of bouncing back to your high school career, I mean, you had a stellar, stellar career in high school. You had a 249 ERA, 76 blocks with 198 strikeouts and 180 innings. So you averaged more than a strikeout per inning. Uh, what fueled your success at this level to kind of get you drafted? Um, I don't know what fueled it. I know that, um, you know, I, I'm not an overpowering guy. I never have been. You know, even in high school, I wasn't ever the hardest thrower. You know, I I threw hard and I was, you know, had decent velo, but there were other guys in the area that were, you know, low nines, mid nineties. And I wasn't that type of guy. I I take advantage of my ability to throw a lot of strikes, not walk a lot of people, not get in trouble. Baseball has always been a lot more natural to me. Um, Never really had to work as hard at baseball as I did in other sports. Um, I also never realized, you know, the potential that I did have within the game of baseball. And I think once I've now become, you know, since I've been drafted, it's I've transitioned to be like, okay, this is a lifestyle. This is my job and try to take advantage of every opportunity. And in high school, I kind of wish I would have, you know, maybe done a little bit more with the baseball side. I just didn't have any 
any idea what I, I had in the tank to really produce. And, uh, you know, I think that might be the one thing I would wish I would have done more, but I don't think I really would have done anything different <laughs> looking back. Jake. So when you were just at the age of 17, that's, that's when you ended up getting the call that you were going to be drafted to the Mets. How, how did that feel that at 17, you knew that you were going to be playing some sort of professional baseball at such a young age? Um, the call wasn't even the, you know, the call wasn't the weirdest or the most surprising moment. Actually, that was uh, the draft day and the draft process was a uh, long one. Um, I'd only talked to one scout. I talked to one organization. Um, I had a lot of trust in the scout and, you know, he, he trusted what I had as an, you know, as a player. Uh, one of the reasons why I went so late in the, in the draft was because I was not really looking to go play college baseball. It was, you know, you draft me. If you have a spot to take me, take me. I don't really care about the, the round. I don't, you know, that didn't really matter to me. Um, the whole process was crazy. I ended up being scouted and seen my senior night of high school, of my high school baseball season. I pitched in two games in the high school level after that night. He, they were there to see me. Um, the draft was a month later. Um, so there was a lot of things that went on in the pre-draft phases that, I mean, looking back, that month was packed. I mean, we traveled to Jacksonville, my family and I, Gainesville. Port St. Lucie, Florida to throw um, was just everything that tr transpired in that month after I was seen that night, it, it, it went by in a blink of an eye. And it was it, honestly crazy just to look back and think about what actually happened in that month makes the draft day process and the reality of me being drafted, not even, I didn't even really think about it because we had been through so much leading up to it. Now, moving over to, to what you've kind of done in the minors is you've had a great, literally the name of our podcast, Come Up, working from the low minors, and now you're playing for the AA Binghamton Rumble Ponies. How has those transitions been, climbing each and every ladder, and how, you know, from working to the low A now to double A has been different? Yeah, you know, it, with, with COVID, it, it, it impacted a lot of different things, um, but my first couple of years in pro ball was a complete 360 from what I was once doing. Um, you know, you're, you're living on your own, you're in a hotel, you're traveling, taking care of your body in a different way. Your off seasons are not off seasons. They're training opportunities. It's a, it's an opportunity to get better. Um, I never had that, never thought of that. Um, and honestly, I wasn't ready to play professional baseball when I first got drafted. Um, the idea of why I was drafted and why the scout in the New York Mets organization, I feel had confidence in me was because I was confident in myself. And I knew that if I was given an opportunity that I wouldn't pass it up. Um, so the first couple of years, if you look statistically, I struggled, you know, I, I was overmatched in a lot of different areas. I didn't have the secondary pitches that a lot of guys that had been playing, you know, had, and looking back, it's, you know, you look at it, my first year of pro ball, I'm playing with guys that are 22, 23, 24 years old that were out of college. Um, no wonder they were having more success than me. No wonder they were better prepared than I was. Um, I had never been in a situation like that. I, I was coming from high school where I showed up to the field 30 minutes before the game and warmed up. You know, it wasn't a lifestyle. It was just kind of an activity that I did while I was in high school. Um, and that's what really took it. It took two, two legit, three legit off seasons to understand my body you know, understand who I was as a pitcher. And that kind of has transitioned myself to be way more confident, confident in my ability. And then also my, uh, just overall, my performance on the mound has changed because I've been able to embrace the off season and put what I can do all, all year into, you know, moments when I finally get on the mound. Yeah, you can, you can definitely tell this is true. Like, the workup and all that, because it looks like you were made for the moment. You pitched in game one of the Class A short season championship with the, the Brooklyn Cyclones against the Lowell Spinners. Uh, you pitched six innings, gave up one hit, three walks, and had one strikeout in the first game of that series. Let's do a little walk through that game. Start when you were told that you were taking the mound. What what was the feeling? What were you 
feeling like how are you going to go about it yeah i think it, you know you play the whole season and it, it's you know there's a lot of ups and downs throughout that season you know a lot of people look at the look at what what i did during the year and it's like wow he had, he had a nice year he had a really good year and it's like you know the beginning of that year was dealt with a ton of adversity you know i i didn't make a full season squad out of camp um you know i was frustrating uh you know i i didn't understand why um and it was just a lot of like okay i gotta really figure it out now you know and there's a lot of coaches at the higher levels um that really you know were in my ear being like you know you got this stuff you just gotta go out and you gotta really just throw well and once you throw well a couple times it's going to just steamroll into the next start and the next start and the next start. Um, and that's exactly what happened. And uh, the semifinals uh, three game series we had, you know, I thought I was going to get game three. I was all excited. You know, I'm going to pitch in, you know, playoff game. Um, and our manager um, Fonzie was like, you know, you're not going to get the ball tonight. And I was like, Oh, okay. He's like, cause we're going to win tonight and you're going to start us for the next round. And I was like, well, I just want the ball. I don't really care what way it is. I just want to pitch one more time and, you know, end my year, um, you know, my best professional season so far, I want to end it on, you know, a playoff start where I can pitch well. Um, and I told that to our farm director. I was like, just before that, before that playoff game, you know, in the round before I was like, just, just win tonight so I can throw one more time. That's all I want to do. And, you know, we won and I was able to do that. And that whole game and that whole night was, uh, before before the championship game was it was crazy because I'm from New Hampshire which I grew up 30 minutes away from Lowell you know, I probably had about 250 people there that um, had found out that I was thrown that night and they literally just drove down to see that game you know all the kids I played with in Little League and coaches I had growing up from every sport from hockey to baseball to football like it was really crazy my my dad flew up um, from Florida and my my now wife uh, she, she also flew up from Florida cause that's where we were living at the time. And, you know, there's 200 people there. It was crazy. Um, so being that and having that environment and being able to go out and throw well, you know, it was a pretty cool day. And then for us to be able to cap it off and win a championship was, you know, not many people get an opportunity to do that. Um, even though it is minor league baseball and it's not the ultimate goal of winning a major league championship, it's still hard to win. And to do that is, uh, it's pretty cool. So let's let's do a little walkthrough with the pregame and all the way to taking the mound the first time. Your adrenaline must have been soaring. What were your thought? What were the thoughts going through your head? Um, well, honestly, I'm not a very uh, you know raw raw guy. I'm very calm. I walk around. I never run. I just kind of walk around. I do my thing. I follow, you know, I'm, I'm very routine oriented. You know, I follow my routine. Um, I don't change it. doesn't matter the environment. Um, you know, it could be 20 degrees out or it could be a hundred degrees out. My routine routine is the same way. Um, you know, having that helps you in an environment where, yeah, it was a pretty big game. You know, it's, you know, it's probably the biggest game I pitched that year. Um, but I mean, I didn't, I didn't really go out in any different than I did the start before, um, you know, going into that game, I knew that they're a really big contact team. So different ideas of how I'm going to pitch them that changes a little bit. Um, you know, I, I do usually am able to get more strikeouts and I'm able to do that and I don't walk as many guys, but with a team is, you know, and the game dictates the, the way you pitch too. you know, it was zero, zero through, through, through six, um, you got to be a little bit more um, at he's, you know, you're going to take some off a little bit in different areas, you know, two, two pitch. You don't want to finish a guy and then get three, two. And if you get three, two, you don't want to give them a cookie because one swing of the bat can put you guys down. And so you got to kind of go at it a little differently versus if you were up, you know, five, nothing, then you can play around with guys a little bit more. So the whole idea of pregame in game, it's once the game starts, it's just, you go out there and you just try to not give up a run. That's the idea of the, of, as a pitcher, give your team every chance to win. And, you know, that Red Sox affiliate was loaded with talent. I mean, those guys didn't swing and miss very often. And, you know, you have to trick them a little bit. And even when you trick them, they're still putting contact on the ball. And 
Mm-hmm. But it was a cool experience. It was a cool game. And, you know, hopefully we're, we have an opportunity to go play sometime soon. Uh, <laughs> hopefully spring yeah. training can start pretty soon. Um, I'm pretty sure spring training, it starts one on the 17th. But um, going back to your routine, I know a lot of pitchers. They're very superstitious. And they never, like you said, they never break up the routine. They never change it up. What what makes your routine good for you? What what is your routine? Well, I think there's there's a, there's a difference in like how you can go about your routine. There's like your 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 throwing routine. Sorry about that. Your throwing routine, um, and then you have your pregame routine, your day before routine. I think it's a little different professionally you know, it's your job, you know, you don't have to worry about different things outside sources uh, as maybe a college kid would have to deal with. So like the day after a start, I know what I'm doing. I know what my mindset is for that day. And that my routine for a game starts the day after I pitch, you know, there's a whole thing where, you know, 65 feet, you know, don't spin anything, just kind of get the arm loose again. You know, that's a big lift day, a lot of bike, a lot of run, then the following day, it, it, you know, you have a, you have a routine for each day. Um, and I guess like you find the routine when you find success and you want to implement and repeat the success that you had. The easiest way to do that is if you have a routine, <laughs> you know, if one day you go out there and you pitch seven innings, strike out 10 and you're feeling great. And then you change your whole pre, you know, pregame workout, different things like that. And you give up five runs in two innings you're probably going to want to repeat what you did the time before. And I think I just kind of fell in a groove where things were going well and I was being successful. It's like, okay, this is what works for me. This gets me ready at the right time. This gets my arm going, my mind in the right place. And um, I know a lot of guys do different things. Some guys are super relaxed and are talking away. Some guys are super, you know, locked in and they won't say a word to anybody. I kind of float the middle. I'm really nonchalant. I'm really go with the flow, but I don't like to talk to anybody I like to just kind of stay within myself, but I'm, I'm relaxed enough where I don't get overwhelmed type of thing. Yeah. And you talk about in your routine, you get into a groove, right? And that's what you did in game one there. The first three innings were almost flawless. You only threw nine balls in, in 24 pitches. Um, you had a cool nine up, nine down there in the first three innings. Now I, I know pitcher as a pitcher, many of them try and block out what's going on around them and just go out there and toss, right? Because that's the easiest way to keep your mind on the end goal. It's the easiest way to keep your mind kind of just calm and centered. But were there any thoughts of anything further, anything like a a perfect game, no hitter that you had there after three innings? Because to to do that, A, in a a double A game is incredible, but how about game one of the the championship series there? Were, Were there any thoughts there that you had after that third inning? No, I think you get, you get in a groove and it's, you, you kind of block everything out. You know, you get, you get to the point where it's like, okay, you got, you know, I've gotten through the order, you know, what did they do differently? Or what did I, what do I need to do differently? Cause when you have guys and this is where minor leagues are really kind of something special is, you know, the leadoff hitter for, for Lowell was and is an elite an elite prospect. I mean, the guy is unbelievable. Jimenez Mm -hmm. to get him out every at bat is impossible. The guy hits 340 at every level. You're not going to get him out every time, but he can get himself out, you know, a good amount of time. Same with any hitter. They're going to get themselves out. So that's kind of the way I looked at it is these guys are loaded with, you know, prospect after prospect after prospect, let them get themselves up. Don't give them anything easy to hit, but don't, don't back away so much that they can get, you know, free passes and then get things going. Um, honestly, it's a lot easier to pitch when you give up a, a, a walk or a hit. Cause then it's like, okay, that's done. Um, right. I had a couple of times where it was like, you get in the fifth and you haven't given up a hit and it's like, Oh, okay, this is kind of cool. I'm in an uncharted territory. And then the first guy I go out there and see ropes a double down the line because you're you you, you're you're losing your focus just a little bit and it doesn't matter what level you're at if that focus isn't exactly locked in mistakes happen um so i guess in the playoff game it's like you know what i i gotta be locked in i i can't really miss a pitch or you know 
take something off this one because if I do, it could be a, you know, solo shot and we lose the game one, nothing. And then the game is looked at completely different. So you, so you do realize it in, oh, yeah. in, in the have, moment most of the time. I, I think if you don't realize it, you're not paying attention to the game enough. <laughs> um, you know, every, every time everybody there knows if you're the only one there that isn't realizing it, then something's weird. I, or, <laughs> that's just not who I am. I, I, I pay attention to the details a lot and overanalyze a lot of things. Could be a negative thing at times, but with, with the reality of that, everybody knows what's going on. And if they, if, I think if they tell you they're not, or they don't know what's going on, they're lying to you because they have to. Yeah. And that's, that's one of the things a lot, a lot of pitchers say is, is when it comes to that, that you got to stay locked in at all times. Another thing is that sixth inning after they kick you out, a lot of pitchers are, are normally upset about being pulled when they're pitching very well. Were you upset that you were being pulled or did you just completely have trust in the guys behind you knowing that you were going to end up getting the win and you had faith in them that you could get your own win? It's a helpless feeling. And it's not because the guys behind you aren't, aren't elite because every guy that, you know, you play with is, you know, a professional and they go about their work and, but it's a helpless feeling because you're like, you know what, I did my job. You know, now this is, you know, my buddy's turn to do his job and, you know, for him to, you know, dominate this game and do something special too. Um, we're all in the same boat of trying to make it to the big leagues. And the only way to make it to the big leagues is to be as dominant as possible. So at that point, it's a sigh of relief off my shoulders because it's like, you know what? I did my job. Now it's my guy's turn to go do his job. And I think that's different than in, in, in other levels like college and high school. It's like ultimately the goal is to just win the game. And that's how everybody's going to be successful is if, if you win every game, it doesn't matter what level you're at, you're going to move. And that's the whole thing. It's like that's why winning a championship at a you know, minor league level is important because it means that you were the best at that level meaning that you deserve to go to the next level. And that's the name of the game is how can you move? How can you move up? Yeah. So rolling off the, the win, you got credited with the win and you're suddenly part of the heavy minor league chat. How do you feel taking the first game of the series and helping your team win the class a short season title and getting in that heavy chatter? Yeah, it's cool. You know, I, you always try to win. Like, that's just kind of what it comes down to. You want to win in everything you do. And, you know, we were able to win and, you know, I was able to, and, you know, I was able to help the team get to that point. And it's fun when you, it's fun when you win it, you know, losing's awful. It just really is. There's nothing else to it. Um, so yeah, for us to win, you know, we were treated really well. The, you know, the organization was proud of us as a team and, and as an affiliate. And that's, that's, it's, it's a great recognition. We went to city field you know, I know a lot of the guys that are up at the big league level, you know, because they've been, you know, in the minor leagues and they moved their way up, you know. Um, so going there and seeing them and them being proud of you and them being like, you know, nice work. It's like, you know, it's kind of like that's that's a cool feeling. But ultimately, it's it's not forgotten about, but it's, you know, put in the back of your head like, yep, you know what? I want a championship, but the big but it's like next year needs to be a year that you you, you know, you do it again. I think that's the most frustrating thing about baseball and probably sports in general is the minute you do something really well, the next day starts your preparation to do the next thing really well. And it's so annoying because you could dominate for, for a hundred days straight and do everything perfect. But then on the day 101, you fail. All you think about is the day you did not do something perfect. And it, that's, I think it's sports in general. So yeah, the moment was awesome. You know, the city, like literally the city of Brooklyn was like so cool. Like playing in Brooklyn is unreal. They have 8,000 fans every night and they're into it. They're baseball fans. And you know, the announcers are cool. The, the in between the inning stuff is cool. The atmosphere is cool. And that's great baseball. Like it really is. If you can play minor league baseball in there, you know, in Brooklyn or go to a game in Brooklyn, it is really fun. But ultimately you don't want to play there forever. You want to get out of there. So it's kind of like a, you know, win-win both ways, I guess. Now, you know, with COVID impacting everything, impacting college, sports, everything in the world right now, in the minor league system, what, what is the next step for you? What, what is going to be next for you to complete that dream of being part of the 
0.2% population to go professional. Yeah, I think the next thing is just to, you know, you know, COVID is a, uh, COVID's affected everything, like you said, and it's affected us, you know, as baseball players, but it's affected a lot more people in a lot bigger ways. Um, so the next biggest thing and the next step is just being able to go back and have a normality within baseball, um, being able to play a game with fans. Um, that That's what you want. That's what we're striving for. But now it's just, you know, right now frame of mind is how can I get as, how can I get better today and fulfill my, my, my full potential. Um, so COVID stinks. COVID's all, like, it just stinks, but being able to work out and perfect your craft and get better and learn. Um, not many guys get the opportunity to go from, you know, you know, I was pitching the summer a little bit, you know, you know, maybe there was going to be a season, you know, maybe I was going to get invited to the alternate site, different things, different dynamics, being ready to go, but being able to really work out and get my body in the best shape it's ever been in from June to, you know, what are we, February now? Not many guys get that opportunity in pro ball. It, it's not usually in season. You're there from February to September, October, and then you have November, December, and January to get your body ready. Like this has been a eight, nine month transition of just pure working out and training and bettering yourself that you don't get that opportunity very often. And it, it, it's a really important one. And I think that although COVID has been a, a bummer and it impacted a lot of things, that's one positive thing. And to be able to go out in spring training and show your talent, show what you've been putting together and the work you've been doing. That's the next goal. That's the next step. It's just being able to get down there and throw and uh, get back into a competitive environment again. Yeah. And COVID pretty much took away all of the minor league seasons last year. So nobody was able to really go out and get their work in and actually be able to play. Um, even the, uh, what is that? The second site for most teams. Uh, did you, did you know any, or, were you in contact with anybody about being at the second site possibly, or were you just sitting at home and training on your own? Yeah, no, I, uh, I mean, I was lucky enough. I was in spring training a little earlier than most, most minor league guys. I was invited to mini camp um, down there. And so I got to spring training early February um, last year and, uh, and I was able to, you know, train and throw and I was ready to go. I, you know, threw a couple innings uh, simulation, you know, getting ready that if, you know, opportunity came and I needed to throw on a big league side, I'd be ready to go. Um, fast forward to when COVID happened and they, you know, major league baseball was back and they had the alternate site. Um, you know, I had communication with our farm director, our pitching coordinator and different things like that, that, you know, anything is possible. You never know. Uh, just be ready for things that happen. Um, I ended up throwing for, um, an indie ball team. I got some innings down there that, you know, that got set up for me to go do that um, when I couldn't be at the alternate site or wasn't at the alternate site. Um, so that was a good experience to go down there and just get some innings, throw some live uh, to live hitters in a game situation. Um, you know, it, it, it was just different. And, you know, being able to get about 30 innings down there, that was key. And it, it was important to be able to do that. And uh, so I, I didn't miss a full year of baseball. It was just a weird year. And I think it impacted mm -hmm. everybody in a different way. It's just been weird. I know a lot of college guys tried to play summer ball and, you know, started or didn't have it. And, you know, it's just impacted everybody. So it's, it's who trained the hardest, who was able to better themselves now. Um, but to answer your question about the alternate site, yeah, it was a possibility. Everything's a possibility within minor league baseball. You never know. You could get a call one day and I could get a call right now saying, Hey, you got to come down to Florida. You know, you never know. It's just that type of weird yeah. world. And um, you're right. You never know what could happen, especially now with COVID. But in general, I mean, as as a kid, you know, you you want to go in and, and you think about playing in the big leagues or whether it's playing in the MOB, NFL, NBA, whatever sport it is. Right. You want to think about what do I need to do to take it to the next level? Right. So if you were to give some advice to people who are younger kids, whether that's, you know, the elementary school level, middle school, high school, even, even in college, not even at the pro level yet, what would be the, the one tidbit of advice that you'd give them in order for them to have better success down the line? Uh, it's hard. Cause everybody's so different. 
Uh, people have different situations, different dynamics, different passions, different skill sets. So to kind of give like a softball or maybe, a, you know, incorporate everything into it, it's the idea of like having fun. Like that's a big thing. Like you need to like love what you're doing. But I think the biggest thing that I've learned since being like in pro ball and, and being around the best and the best, like I've seen Jacob deGrom work. Uh, I've talked to Jeff McNeil. I'm really close with Pete Alonzo. Like these guys are the elite of the elite. They take their job so seriously and they are able to have fun at the same time. I think that's important. I wish I would have known that as a kid, like I can take this very seriously, but I can still have fun with it and I can like act as if this is my job. So I think for like, maybe not little leaguers, you know, high schoolers, but definitely for college guys and high school guys that want to make a career out of this or want to go to the next level, being college or, you know, college guy going to play pro ball, take it as if it's your job, you know, dedicate every moment you can to that sport, to that objective of moving yourself to the next level. And if you look at it as like, this isn't a hobby, this isn't a game, this is, could be my life. Like, I think that would be it. Like just lock in and realize that like you have something special, take advantage of it. I think I, I wish I would have had that mindset when I was in high school. Cause I would have done a lot of things differently. Um, knowing that this is my life, this is my job. I wish I would have known that I was in high school. Cause I'd have been way more taking it way more serious. I would have warmed up a lot better. I would have uh, done, a, I just would have done things differently. I think a lot of kids would do things differently after they look back on it. I'm fortunate enough to be in an op, have the opportunity and been, be in a spot where I'm still playing the game and I don't want to ever stop playing the game. Um, so I'm taking it as serious as I can, but I'm also having fun with it, making the most out of the moment. One last thing before we let you go here is, you know, the three of us, we're at Oswego, which is 30, 45 minutes away from Syracuse. Hopefully you get the honor of getting pulled up to AAA to play with them at Syracuse Mets, and we all get the chance to go see you and then actually talk to you in person. Yeah, I'd love that opportunity. I would love to be able to, you know, I – I, uh, you know, family always asks, well, where are you going to play this year? Be like the, the, the nice answer is, oh, I don't really know. The, the more direct answer is I really don't care. Uh, wherever I go, I have to dominate. Wherever I go, I have to pitch really well. Wherever I go, I have to be the best, whether that's low A or the big leagues, like I got to be the best where I am. So I hope I can go to AAA. I hope I get the opportunity. And it's a lot of guys will say, how'd you get to the big leagues? Or how'd you stay in the big leagues? You know, I, they all say I was given an opportunity and I didn't miss on it. And that's the same thing in minor league ball. It's like, you get a promotion, don't miss, you know, you're going to shoot your shot. Don't miss it. Um, and that's how it is. And like to get the opportunity to go play in double A, if that's where I go or high A in Brooklyn or triple A in Syracuse, you know, whenever, wherever they send me, I got to pitch well. And that's the name of the game is pitching. Well, being a good teammate, being a professional but at the end of the day like just playing well and doing your job that's all you can do and let the cards fly where they're gonna Harrison thank you so much for coming on the third episode of the come up and good luck to you in your future uh once again along alongside Jake Johnson and Nathan Thompson I am Michael Gross and this is the come up